So we live in a fallen and broken world, a, pe- a world where authority has been abused, where people have been manipulated. And there's a demonic strategy actually at work in the world because where there is a lack of authority and submission, there is a place for chaos and disorder and every evil thing. And so there is a demonic strategy at work to undermine godly authority. Have you noticed, and I'm not, I'm not big into conspiracy theories. I don't think we need a conspiracy of human beings on this world. It's just Satan knows what's going on. But if you look at movies and TVs, for example, and TV shows, how many fathers are portrayed as brave, clever, resourceful, brilliant people? They're, not, they're always the idiot, aren't they? It's always like the children and the mother outwitting the father. And it's funny. But in, on so many levels, the, the, the liberal agenda today is, is to destroy the family unit. I noticed one of the DA guys recently has posted that the family should not be the building block of society. And it's crazy because the, the family is the first place where we learn these values. But unfortunately, because we live in a fallen world, some families have not been safe places. They've not been places where people understand what a loving, caring father is exercising authority for the benefit of his children. So what do we do with such people? Well, we've got to explain that the answer to abusive authority is not to eradicate authority. The answer to abuse is not no use, it's right use. And when people begin to experience a godly authority, when they experience that, that Christ-like servanthood, it creates a safe place. You know, I've often said this, you will never discover truly what God is like by looking at your father. But you can discover what a, tr- what a good father is like by looking to God. And it's first and foremost coming to God. And the the issue is this. If you cannot submit to authority, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because this this thing of, well, I'll I'll submit to Jesus but not to men, is is a, a statement that holds no grounds. Because to submit to Jesus is to submit to men. Because that's what he requires of us. And actually... You know, I, I've, I've learned this uh, principle of submission and the blessing that comes from it. It's not always been easy. And sometimes I've been misunderstood, uh, overlooked, uh, all of these things. But I've realized this. My faith in Christ is what enables me to submit to man. Because whatever I suffer at the hands of man is in God's hands. Because I'm doing first and foremost what he requires of me. And we need to submit everything to God. You know, even our giftings. I've heard people say this, you know, um, I need to be part of church where they will release me in my gifting because God's given me that gift and I will answer to him one day for how much I've used my gift. So no, 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 I don't think you will. I think you will answer to God for what you've done with what he's put in you. You will answer to God for your gifting, but it won't be how much you've used it. It will be whether you've used it in a godly manner. So I believe I've got a particular gifting. Let's say... You may completely disagree with me on this. I think maybe I'm, I'm gifted in preaching and teaching. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm a man under submission. I'm somebody else's team. So what if Andrew, for example, and, and the other uh, elders in Josh Jan said, Mike, we don't want you to teach anymore. Should my action then and my reaction be, but I've got a gift of teaching Therefore, I must leave this church because I'm going to answer to God if I never teach. Or should my answer be this? I place my gifting at your feet to use or not use. When I stand before God and God says, what did you do with your gifting? I'll say, I laid it at the feet of those you put in authority over me. You'll say, well done. How often did you get to preach? I didn't. Well, well done. And then the rest of the eldership team will stand before him and they say, what did you do with that gift that Mike placed at your feet? Oh, well, we just put it in a cupboard and hid it away. 
You see, I've got to do what is right before Jesus first and foremost. And I trust God that if he has genuinely put a gift in me, that he will raise it up at the right time. No man can prevent that. But if I'm deceived and I think I've got a gift that I don't, then so much better that I'd submit it to somebody else and they never release me. And so when people struggle with authority, we've got to lovingly guide them into a place where they feel safe, where they can understand that authority is not used to oppress or to abuse or manipulate or to keep down. A parent, for example, tells the children not to play with matches. Why? Because they want to control and manipulate their children? No, they want to stop their children burning the house down and burning themselves. It's a loving thing that I'm putting restrictions on you and I'm putting boundaries on you for your own safety. And here's the thing, I'm not always going to tell you why I'm putting boundaries on you as a child. When my, when my girls were very small, we'd go to a shopping mall and their temptation was, Here, this, here's this massive space, we can just run. We said, no, no, you never got anywhere where we cannot see you. You stay close to us. Why? Well, let me tell you in graphic detail what happens to children who are abducted. No, it would not be appropriate, would it? Why am I telling you this? Because I love you and I want to keep you safe. Trust me on this. And God is the same. He doesn't always tell us the why. He asks us to trust him. So here's a question. When it comes to authority and submission, is trust earned or is trust given? Do I need to earn your trust or do you need to give it to me regardless? I think the answer is both. As a man in authority, I better do everything in my power to make it easy for you to trust me. I better demonstrate myself to be a trustworthy man who's put your interests first. And if I constantly just hit you with a big say, you will trust me, you will submit to me. You know, if I have to tell you, you will submit to me, I'm your elder. I've already lost, haven't I? There may be occasionally an extreme circumstance where you have to do that. I think once, once I've been an elder in Josh Jen for nearly 15 years. In 15 years, once, I've said, I'm telling you as an elder of the Lord Jesus Christ to be quiet now. And that was just, I tried everything else. This guy wouldn't shut up in a meeting. But if I have to use my eldership noddy badge, then I've lost. But likewise, I have to submit and trust regardless. One of the things I hear from people sometimes in, in marriage situations where a husband's failed, a, a, a wife will say, well, I forgive you, but I can't trust you anymore. I go, whoa, 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 excuse me? Well, wh how is that a scriptural or a biblical response to what's happened? What does 1 Corinthians 13 say? Love always trusts. You know, here's the reality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's the best thing because it's got a response. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Love always trusts. It's just not really stupid. Okay. If I'm an alcoholic... And uh, I go to rehab and I, 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 I stop drinking. And then I need a job. And somebody offers me a job in a pub. Is that a good idea? No, because I've got a weakness. So it's not I hate you and I don't trust you so you can't work in my pub. It's, you know what? I love you enough not to put you in a place where you, where you will be tested in an area of your weakness. If I'm a drug addict, I'm... I'm you know, we had a situation, we had a guy in the church, he'd been miracul miraculous uh, testimony of how God had uh, got him saved and prevented him going to prison for all kinds of charges. And he was going around and he was preaching the gospel to people, seeing people saved. Uh, and then he came to us the one day, and I think because God was really using him, he got a little big, bit big for his boots and he, he didn't think he needed to submit anymore. He thought he knew better than us. And... Um, 
he said that he was going to start sharing a flat with a friend of his who was also an ex-drug addict. I said, guys, that is really not a wise idea. You don't trust us. Well, I do trust you, but I know you. <laughs> it's not a good idea. They went ahead, and lo and behold, both of them ended up defrauding the company they worked for to get money to pay for drugs. He ended up in prison. As a happy ending, he repented. He's, he's been restored. But trust is not... There's, there's, there's still a measure of trust. And again, um, how we fail determines how we, how we move forward. So... How many wives have we got here? If you're a wife, stick your hand up. Keep your hand up if your husband has never made a mistake. Oof, that's a shocker. So, so your husband has said, trust me on this. Go with me on this. I need you to follow me on this. And you followed him and it's been a disaster. So next time he says, no, no, you need to follow me on this. What's your response? No, I can't trust you anymore. Uh, the last time was a disaster. So, no, no, we, we've got to continue to fulfill godly roles. <laughs> See, here's the thing. Here's the thing. And, and people think I'm being chauvinistic and misogynistic. But this is actually a beautiful thing for ladies, actually. Because if I've got a major decision to make in, in, my, in my home, to buy a house, to buy a car, to where to send my kids to school, as a husband who's smart, I listen to my wife's perspective. And sometimes her perspective I need to listen to more than my own. But at the end of the day, when, when a decision needs to be made, I'll say, it's my decision. And you know what happens then? Is if it's a success, I can say, haven't we done well? And if it's an absolute failure, I say, you know what? I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And so my wife has all the privileges and all the benefits of partaking in that decision and none of the responsibility of carrying the weight for it. And she loves that. It makes her free. Likewise, in the church, we don't have any female elders because we see scripturally very clearly, and I don't have the time to do, do, deal with that as much as I would have liked, but scripture talks about eldership being male. Now, we don't have female elders, but all, most of the elders are married. I think all the elders currently are married. Do we have any single elders? Yes. Yeah, we have one or two single elders. Most of our elders are married. And so in our elders' meetings, often our wives are there and they can speak and they have a voice and they can change the whole direction of this church when they speak. And we go, ah, that's smart, that's God, that's wisdom, that's the Holy Spirit. We better listen to that. But when the decision is made, my wife, has, my wife and the wives with her have all the privileges of being in those meetings and, and speaking and having their voice heard. But when mistakes are made... They're on my shoulders and Andrew's shoulders and the shoulders of the other elders. When we are named in legal cases for what we preach, it's my name, not my wife's name that goes on the piece of paper. Thank God, because I want to protect her. Not because I think I'm superior, but because my makeup is I can handle those things in a way that she can't. One of the difficulties that we have often is this, and I try and teach elders when they come on to eldership, is that when you're an elder you often get a lot of abuse. People saying things, people accusing you, people blaming you, people telling you you've wrecked their lives. And I know it's part of the deal. So it happens to me, I shrug it off and I move on. What I sometimes forget is my wife is a lot more sensitive than me. And so when those things happen, I have to sometimes help lead her through that because she's hurt on my behalf. But I would much rather the arrows come at me and not at her. I want to protect her. Not because I think I'm superior, but because I love her. And because I honor her. And I believe that what we, what we teach about the roles of men and women, far from trying to oppress women, far from trying to keep them down, is to elevate them and say, you are a princess, you are the daughter of the king, and I want to do everything to honor you and respect you and protect you and see you thrive. Any husband, and I think we're all guilty of this from time to time because of flesh, who tries to lord it over his wife for his own benefit, is going to answer to God. 
This is not misogyny. This is an absolute love and respect for women. You see, one of the, the, the kind of culture of the day is rather like when Miriam and Aaron complained about Moses. And they said, we know he is a prophet, but aren't we prophets too? And there's that kind of culture that easily creeps into Christian circles where it says, I know that you're, you're an elder, but I've got the Holy Spirit in me. Jesus said, you will no, need no man to teach you. Did Jesus say that? Yes. Jesus said, time will come in when you will need no man to teach you. And yet in Ephesians, we read that he gave us teachers. So is Jesus confused? No. We need to hold what he's saying in balance. One is this, that we can hear God for ourselves. We can hear the Holy Spirit for ourselves. The Holy Spirit is poured on all flesh, men and women, young and old. But we still need teachers. And as a teacher in the house, I need teachers. I need people to teach me. I need men to lead me. I am a man under authority. And as a husband, if I myself am not a man under authority, then I can't be a good husband and lead my wife well. You know, one of the things often when we preach on the authority of elders, we get men coming back at us. And in one meeting that was happening and uh, somebody had preached on, on the authority of elders and submission to elders. And a couple of the men were getting a little bit upset because, you know, I'm a man. And at one point, one of the women stood up and said, I don't know what the problem is. This is what we do all the time. And actually, the relationship between husband and wife, in many ways, is, is, is similar to, to this relationship with an elder. It's very similar in some ways of my relationship to Andrew. I recognize I'm, I'm like Andrew's wife. That may sound really odd to you. I'm, I'm not confused about my gender identity. I, I'm, what I'm saying is this, that I recognize that we're equals. We're both elders. He isn't better than me. He's better at me than some stuff, okay? But we're equal before God. But within that, whilst we're both elders, I recognize a grace gift on him that I don't carry, and so I submit to him. If I've got an opinion and he's got an opinion, his opinion carries more weight and I will submit to it. And then when I'm dealing with the church, I deal with it as though it's a joint decision, even because I've yielded to it and made it mine. And one of the mistakes we make in homes, one of the mistakes elders make is they go home um, and they're afraid of the wives. Can you believe that? And uh, they'll say to the wife, Andrew said, we need to be at this meeting. Because he knows his wife's not going to be. No, no, no. That's, that's, yeah. I need to come home and say to my wife, my angel, I've decided we need to be at this meeting. Why have I decided? Well, Andrew asked, and I've decided to submit to him. Likewise, as parents, you know, sometimes uh, moms make a mistake. They say, your dad said, because I, I, be, I don't like my children not liking me. So let me make the dad the bad guy. No. Any division between hu husband and wife, between mum and dad, is just going to cause chaos in the family. There needs to be a united front. And a wife, even if it's not been her personal conviction, needs to get behind her husband on these things. And when you come before the children, say, we have decided. Does that make sense? The children feel more secure. Are there any women ready to stone me yet? I hope you're hearing my heart because this is the kind of thing that people manifest about because it goes so against the culture of our day. Let me ask you, in Ephesians it says this, Husband, uh, wives, submit to your husbands. Is that what Scripture tells us? But then it goes on to say what? Husbands... Love your wives as Christ loves the church, laying his life down for her. So there's an instruction to wives and there's an instruction to husbands. Who's got the harder instruction there? Personally, I might be biased. I think, it's, I think the, the, the requirement of a husband is way harder. I, I think it's way harder. And here's the thing, that if a wife sees a husband who will lay his life down for her, she will submit to him. 
It will be so much easier. Isn't it easier to submit to somebody you know has got your best interests at heart? But again, the question is, does one depend on the other? And I've done a lot of marriage counseling with couples, and, and the husband's going, she won't submit to me. And he, she's going, he doesn't lay his life down and pick up his underwear and... There's one couple after, I promise you, 12 years of going around the same issue, of them coming, meeting with elder after elder, pointing fingers at each other. Eventually I said to them, you know what, you're wasting our time. Please leave the church. There's no reality to our relationship. You've both ignored everything we've said to you. And not just, I mean, like six or seven different elders had all said the same thing. And instead of taking it to themselves, each of them said, the moment you stop pointing fingers at each other and say, help me, I'm available to you. But until you come to that point, I don't want to hear another word you've got to say. You see, a wife needs to say this. Regardless of my husband's a dog, I want to submit to him and I want to honor him. And the husband needs to be, my wife's a Jezebel. <laughs> She's manipulative and difficult and unsubmissive. So it doesn't matter who you're married to. That's who, God, that's, that's who you join together with. You join together with them for life. You take responsibility for your part of the deal and pray that God will deal with the rest. You see, in a married relationship, your job is not to make your partner more like you. It's your job to help your partner become more like Jesus. It's no wonder Paul said it's better to remain single. Marriage is not for wimps. Biblical, God-honoring marriages is not for wimps. Because it's not conditional on the other person. It's me being Christ-like regardless. Mark Driscoll said this, and I want to read this quote to you. He said, In hearing that males and females are different, modern ears tuned by a culture of egalitarianism are prone to hear that males and females are not equal. That's untrue. The Bible teaches that both men and women are made in the image and likeness of God, which means that men and women are equal by virtue of creation. They not need, did not need to be identical to prove their equality. In the same way that a right hand and a left hand are different, but equally necessary. Subsequently, since we are made male and female, it is clear that God's image and likeness is best shown forth by men and women who function together in partnership like the Trinity, in which God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are equally God with distinct submission and unity. See, when we go back to Genesis, it says male and female, he created them in his image. The first time we've got a hint that things aren't perfect in the garden. God, say, God creates and he says, that is good. He creates and he says, that is good. He creates man, he says, that is very good. And then the first time something isn't good, he says, it is not good for man to be alone. He creates woman. Only together is it truly revealed something of the nature of the Trinity. And that's one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons why as Christians we, we hold the marriage is so sacred. It's one of the reasons why we would fight against gay marriage. Because God has ordained marriage as a picture of something beautiful, of, of the relationship between us and him and the relationship within him that we have with each other. The difficulty is that we're fallen people, and it isn't easy. One of my favorite quotes, I often quote this at, marriage, at weddings that I do, is to husbands. Uh, Next time you're tempted to criticize your wife's faults, remember it's those faults that stopped her getting a better husband than the one she got. Yeah? You can apply that to wives. Yeah? Your spouse's faults are those very faults that stop them getting a better person than they got. We are all on a journey to becoming more like Jesus. And the key to leadership in the kingdom, the key to being an elder or a deacon or home group leader, a husband or a father, for me, one of the, the, the most powerful things we can do is ask God to see people with his eyes and see the evidence of grace on people's lives and what they can become in him. I want to raise my children to be 
what they can be in him. I want to help my wife become what she can become in him. And believe me, in a whole bunch of areas, my wife is way more gifted than I am. When we look at Scripture, we see very clearly that headship is male. Whenever Paul argues for this, he goes back to the creation account. It is not accident that Adam was created first and then Eve. It's not accident that when Jesus came, he chose 12 apostles and every single one of them was male. And some people say, well, he was just bowing to the culture of his day. That was just the only culturally accepted thing. And I go, wait, wait a minute. Did you see who he picked? Who he picked went against the culture of his day. He picked fishermen. He picked a tax collector. And elsewhere it says, if, you know, if, a, if a believer acts an unbeliever, treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. You know, that, that was a, it was a byword for having nothing to do with somebody and, and being a dog and being a, a, a traitor and, and being... A, 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 uh, tax collectors were not honest people. He chose a zealot. He, he chose somebody who wanted to overthrow the enemy by force. He chose Judas, and he knew what was in Judas's heart. He didn't go according to the culture of his day. Jesus was not a slave to his culture. If Jesus had been a slave to his culture, he would never have been crucified. Paul likewise. People say, oh, Paul was just like anti-women because that was the culture of his day. Paul was not anti-women. The ironic thing is this. All the women today who are theologically qualified as to why women should be elders are only theologically qualified because Paul said that women could learn. Isn't that the irony? Paul reversed the culture of his day in many ways. The Bible honors women in so many ways, right from the Old Testament to the New, from, um, from Rahab. She's not even an Israelite. She's a woman of ill repute. And she makes, when, when she comes by faith into the, in, in, into the nation of Israel, she is so embedded in the nation, she becomes one of the ancestors of Christ. Ruth, Esther, Deborah. And some people have argued that Deborah is proof that God wants women to, to lead. But if you look at the story of Deborah, Deborah is a prophet and she comes and she comes to um, uh, Barak and she says, God saying, go into battle. He says, I won't go without you. And she says, for this reason, God will give the glory of the victory to a woman and not to you because he called you to lead and you wouldn't lead with authority. So she was the prophetic voice, but even the prophetic voice, God called to submit under a man in that situation. Elsewhere, women are given inheritance rights, unheard of in, in the ancient world. Jesus himself, uh, at a time where in a legal case, a woman's testimony counted for nothing. If two women saw me murder somebody, and tried to testify about that in court, it would not count. I, w I could literally get away with murder because a woman's testimony counted for nothing. And yet, who is the first great evangelist we see in the gospel accounts? A Samaritan woman that Jesus meets at a well. And she goes into the village and says, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. When he's in the grave, who are the first witnesses to his resurrection? Women. Throughout Paul's writings, he greets and commends women. Women were not ignored. Women were not sidelined. Women were treated with great honor and should still be. Because only in, in partnership with women can men truly express who they are in God. It is not good for man to be alone. A church full of men would be a disaster. 
We're having a man's meeting. That's good. There's times where we need to get together and, and the women can get together and have their butterflies and the whatever, the flowers and the little cups of tea and the cupcakes and the men will get together and have bacon sandwiches and, you know, because <laughs> men and women are different. But if that's all church ever was, how sad would it be? I wouldn't be the man I am in, in God today if it wasn't, first of all, for my mother and if it wasn't for many godly women along the line who've had a huge influence in my life. Men and women are to complement each other. All roles, every role within the church is open to women except that of government. So elders and apostles. Well, you've got elders and apostles. You've got elders' wives and apostles' wives. And behind every good man stands a woman, as they say. But women can serve as deacons, worship leaders. They can teach within boundaries. They can prophesy. Whether they're married or single, young or old, women have a valuable an essential place within the church. Some would say, but it's not fair that women can't be elders. And the answer to that is, life's not fair, get used to it. <laughs> God often isn't fair, he's just. You know, anybody who's got children knows this. When you're being perfectly righteous, your children will say that's not fair because they don't understand what you understand. And I'm asking if you can't fully understand why headship is male, and you go, that's not fair, rather submit to God on this because this is God in his wisdom has chosen to reveal it this way. But the other thing to remember is this, that whilst women can say it's not fair, we're not allowed to be elders, the same is true for 90% of men. Because 90% of men can't be elders either. And let me, into, let me let you into a real secret. And I'm not saying this just to keep you happy. Being an elder sometimes sucks. <laughs> you know what? Being an elder, if you're called to it, is a glorious thing to be. I, I love being an elder. But there are times, I promise you, I've said to God, please take this cup from me. It's, a, it's not a position of glory. It's a position of service and of sacrifice. It's hard enough when you are called to it. If you're not called to eldership, don't try and be one. If you are called to eldership, don't be anything else. But God has created us and he knows how we work. And he knows what, how we will thrive. If you go and play in the position that Jesus asks you to play, you will thrive. If you try and undermine God's ways and play in a position you're not called to do. If you're not a person under submission, you will not carry authority. And you will try and exercise authority without the backing of heaven. I promise you, I've tried that at times. And it's like smacking your head against a brick wall. It's only good when it stops. We need to be a people who don't kick against godly principles. And the godly principle is this. That even in perfection, before creation, before the fall, there was authority and there was submission. Let your attitude be like that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking on the form of a servant, he became obedient, even to the point of death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him and gave him a name that is above every other name. If, the, if we can learn anything from tonight, it's this. 
be a person who will submit even to the point of death. Empty yourself and make yourself nothing. Because when you make yourself nothing and empty yourself, the glory of God fills you and you do great things for God. And really how much authority you carry and what position you hold on this earth is really of very little importance. What will be important is when we stand before him and he asks, did you do what I asked you to do? You can strive for what you want or you can strive for what he wants for you. And ultimately, what he wants for you not only glorifies him best, but will fulfill you the most. That's when we have unity. I hear a lot in churches about unity. We need to go for unity, unity, unity. Unity is not what we aim for. Unity is a byproduct. And unity won't come when we all sit in a circle and sing come by our and wait till we all agree on things. Unity comes when we see, like the Israelites did, the cloud, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, and we say, wherever the Spirit's going, we will follow. We will do God's way. We will go in God's direction. And when we follow, then it, by default, we come into unity. If we try to aim for unity first, all that happens is we, we end up coming around the lowest common denominator and we actually achieve nothing and we end up in compromise. I don't want to live in compromise. I want to live in the fullness of what God's got. So I'm going to follow the Spirit. I'm going to follow God's ways and I'm going to do it His way. And I'm going to encourage as many people as possible to come with me on that journey. And when we do, we will walk into the promised land and into the fullness of our inheritance. Authority and submission. It's not an ugly thing. It's a beautiful thing. Authority is not about suppressing. It's not a boot to keep you down. It's a fence to keep you safe. To keep the predators away. And to let you know exactly where the safe places are. I've learned the beauty of submission. I hope you have as well. And if you haven't and if you're struggling with it, I urge you to have a conversation and chat to somebody and talk it through so that it can become a greater and greater reality in your life. 